you know, it's it's an honor to have uh, Nanda Nilekani here. And there's, there's like a convention when you introduce famous people where you say, and of course this person needs no introduction, but then you go ahead and give an introduction anyway. So that's what I'm also going to do. I'm going to stay with that convention. But I think all of you know that, uh, you know, Nandan is of course one of the founders of Infosys, um, but really I think in some ways he's become better known for his uh, work in policy, his work in technology for India in general. He was of course chairman of the UIDAI. Uh, he's a, he, which is an, invented the UID system and Aadhaar. Um, he's a philanthropist, a creator, an inventor, an entrepreneur. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that because I think anything I say will sort of feel lesser than his accomplishments. And along with him, we have uh, Tanuj Bhojwani, who happens to be a co-author of a book that Nandan and Tanuj have written together called The Art of Bitfulness. And it's actually very relevant. We're having later today, we're talking about the metaverse and the impact of potential impact of the metaverse, uh, you know, not just in terms of obviously technology, but also society and people and people's psyche and so on. So the art of bitfulness is about, you know, the way I can best summarize it is how do you use technology without letting technology control you, right? So how do you sort of stay mindful in your daily life? How do you leverage it as a tool, but not have it be something that con consumes your daily existence. Uh, Tanuj has been involved with iSpirit, which is described as a think tank and do tank, uh, but which has very, been very involved in the India stack and promoting the India stack. Uh, he used to be a young India fellow and uh, he now works uh, very closely with Nandan. So with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, both you, Tanuj and Nandan, and uh, we'd love to hear your thoughts. Sure. Thanks. So, and uh, I'll just explain how we're going to do this session. It's a 45 minute session. Uh, I'm going to speak for about 15 minutes on the India stack and all the various other exciting digital public goods built in India. And then uh, we will have Tanuj uh, talk to me for 15 minutes on some of the things, including on the book. And then the last 15 minutes of the talk, I'll hand over to Tanuj because it's all about how we, what are the, all the techniques and methods we have in the book uh, about how to become mindful and how to be on top of technology. And frankly, he is much closer to them in age and will be able to give a better idea because my style may be a little old fashioned for all the young people in the room. So we're going to do this in three parts. I'll be there for the first half an hour and then Tanut will wrap up in the last 15 minutes. So let me begin by saying that it's a great delight to be speaking to all of you at Ashoka University. I think it's Ashoka is a great place and I congratulate all the people for setting it up and creating a phenomenal learning environment. I have worked with and dealt with, with many Ashoka graduates and they're all very impressive. So I'm sure that all of you will also go on to do really wonderful things. So today I'm speaking about the India stack, which is nothing but a collection of digital public goods that India has built over the last 13 years and built it at population scale, which means it's been built for 1.3 billion people. And this has been done by managing, uh, you know, both regulation and competition and sort of combine using the market, using technology using the legal system, et cetera, to really transform India's digital platforms. And let me start by the, at the beginning. Now, if we go back in the year 2008, only 17% of Indians had bank accounts and financial exclusion was rampant. Cash was rampant. Migrants found it very difficult to send money home. And it was generally a bit of a mess. And then if you go forward, the, and then the number of people unbanked in India in 2011 was in line with the global scenario. In other words, this is a chart showing financial inclusion measured in terms of bank accounts versus GDP. And India was pretty much where it, it was as appropriate to its GDP. And then let's see what happened if you go forward if you go forward from here, 
No, no, different. It's on twenty eighteen. Can you not see? Sorry. I can see. It's it's fine. I saw it. Okay, let me reshare the screen. Sorry, I thought it froze or something. I'm sure. No, no, I saw it. Yes. Yeah. Now, by twenty eighteen, India had massively jumped forward in uh, financial inclusion, and it it really was much more than just based on GDP. And the next chart will show you that India achieved in forty six yeah, in in less than a decade. India achieved what would normally have taken forty six years. In other words, something happened that accelerated financial inclusion in India, and did something in. 10 years what would have taken 46 years so clearly now what was that that happened this acceleration was due to three things one was political will especially after 2014 when the prime minister modi launched the pradhan mantri jandhan yojana plan it was because we have had a very proactive and innovative innovative at the same time safe central bank the reserve bank of india and importantly what i talk about today a set of technologies that we collectively refer to as the india stack now what is the india stack india stack is really digital infrastructure at population scale so everybody in the country either has it or has access to it identity is the first part aadhaar id which you can use to you know authenticate yourself you can use aadhaar to do a kyc so that you can open a bank account you get a mobile connection you can use aadhaar to do a digital signature of a document on a, on your phone then we have a payments layer so the over the years india has built multiple payment systems imps upi aadhaar payment bridge and so on and then the latest thing in the infrastructure is called data empowerment and this is an infrastructure to empower people to have access to their own data and these three things have made a huge difference for india and i'll take you through one by one now all these things were built over time they were not built in one day it began in 2009 when i joined i retired from infosys and joined the indian government in the rank of a cabinet minister to run the uidai we built aadhaar around the same time the uh, npca was set up which was the national payment corporation of india a non profit company set up by rbi and owned by the banks they launched something called imps which allowed you to remit money easily and then over the uh, several years we built different pieces of the puzzle but it's important that they are all at population scale they are all very high volume very low cost very small transaction value and all interoperable so it's like layers and layers of infrastructure were built one on top of the other and that's why the this is so powerful because they are all designed to intermesh and interoperate with each other and the first of course was identity when i started aadhaar project in 2009 very few people had an id because there are a lot of people born without birth certificates in many indian states half the babies didn't get a birth certificate they were born at home and they didn't couldn't go and get the certificate and this is what the challenge we had to deal with and we did that by creating a unique id called aadhaar i assume all of you have it it's a 12 digit number which is random it is using biometric deduplication to remove uh you know things uh, remove duplicates and it has very simple minimal information name address date of birth sex and optionally your email id and phone number now aadhar when i i was in the government from 2009 to 2014 by the time i left we had reached about over 600 million aadhar issued subsequently it crossed 1 billion in 2018 and today it's about 1.3 billion people have an aadhaar and it has a diverse impact it has had 70 billion authentications in other words 70 billion times somebody has used their aadhaar number for authenticating the identity which is about like seven per person kind of thing it has done over 11 billion kycs and part of the reason for the rapid growth of bank accounts and mobile connections is because opening them is so easy close to 300 billion dollars has been transferred using dbt and very 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 useful in the pandemic when you could transfer money directly into bank accounts and more than 5.7 billion transactions have been done in this year last year alone which makes it the world's largest dbt program by far 
This also has closed gaps, but there's a gender gap, education gap, income gap, and overall, of course, gone up from 35% of people with accounts to 80% of people with accounts. So this is really an uh, extraordinary scale up that has happened in India. And a survey done called the State of Aadhaar Report, done just before the pandemic, said that it was the first ID for so many people. And 80% of people felt that Aadhaar had made their uh, uh, access to benefits much more, much more uh, you know, uh, reliable. And overall, about 92% of the people were happy with Aadhaar. So it was really something which showed that it made a difference, positive difference to people's lives. Yeah. Sorry, now the next, the next thing we did I, in 2013, I was interacting with NPCI. I already worked with NPCI because they had built the Aadhaar KYC for banking, Aadhaar payment bridge and so on. So we had worked very closely from 2009 onwards. And around 2013, I had an interaction with them and subsequently after I retired from government, I became an advisor on innovation and public policy to the uh, UIDA, uh, to the NPCI. And we came up with the notion led by Dilip Asbe, who is the current CEO, Hota, who was the previous CEO, my friend and colleague Pramod Varma, who was the chief architect of Aadhaar. We said, we, India needs a very modern, real-time, instant payment system which is very, very flexible, which leverages the best of banks and the best, best of smartphones and modern consumer technology, where different banks can interoperate between their accounts, instant, real time, 24 by seven. And this platform was, uh, Tanuj? Sorry. This platform was launched in May of 2016 by this October of 20, it was doing about 100,000 transactions per month and then demonetization, all that happened. Digital payments took off. Today, UPI does 5 billion transactions in a month. Last month, it did over 5 billion transactions and it did transactions valued at over $1 trillion in the last financial year. So it's really one of the fastest, the fastest growing payment system in the world and the and growth is meant to go to 1 billion transactions a day. So this has dramatically changed your lives. Now I just want to do a quick, uh, uh, I want pe people, can everybody who uses Aadhaar and or UPI put their hand up please? Is anyone not, is anyone not using it? Or they're too sheepish to admit? I don't know. So, any, so this is this is the power of this that everybody is using this stuff. Go ahead. Now, the third big area, which is just beginning, is uh, how do we empower people with their own data? Because today, data is being generated by every digital transaction that you do. We talk about that in our book too. But that data is being appropriated by companies or by governments, not by the individual whose data it is. So we thought, how do we create a way to get people to use their own data? That's how the system account aggregators has started. What this does is it creates what we call the data democracy. Instead of data being used to sell things to you, data is em empowering you to get benefits like get better credit or better personal finance. And this is a complete inversion of data which has not been done anywhere in the world. So this is go the account aggregator is going to revolutionize uh, personal financial credit in India, both to uh, businesses and, uh, and individuals. And it's going to democratize credit. And we believe that properly applied, it will play a big role in the uh, in Indians getting access to uh, finance and big role in the post-pandemic recovery in a very broad-based manner. So fundamentally, what we have done in India is very similar to what has happened in your smartphone world. In the smartphone world, we have a set of platforms that have been built by different companies, smartphones, GPS built by the government, 
the internet built by the government, the clouds with the big guys like Amazon, Microsoft and Google, Google Maps and other maps, payment systems like Stripe, all these things are there. And these are then used by people to build applications that are very powerful. Amazon or Airbnb, Uber, Ola, Flipkart are all built on top of these platforms. So India Stack does exactly the same thing. It enables on the infrastructure of mobile, internet, GPS, and cloud. It allows authentication, KYC, e-sign, a, a digital locker, which is like a massive place on the cloud to keep your records, like your driver's license or your vaccination certificate. It provides and have different devices, UPI. And on top of this, we have seen a lot of great companies coming. So many companies today, like you know, phone pay or the Beam app or Paytm or so so many companies have all built successful multi-billion dollar companies leveraging this infrastructure. And this is a great example of how if you create the right digital public infrastructure with minimalistic design and an open API-based thinking, then lots of exciting innovations can happen on that. And that's what has been done by India Stack. So India Stack. Now the same template is now being applied to health. So the National Health Authority is now looking at how to create uh, a record, electronic health record that are portable, which you can take around with you. So a lot of a lot of stuff happening on the health stack and many other things. The ONDC, the Open Network for Digital Commerce, is unbundling e-commerce in a very similar way. So basically, India is at the forefront of digital transformation at population scale. It's done that over the last 10 years, it's going to do more. And it's a combination of using uh, regulated and unregulated players, using technology and building a culture of innovation on top of this to enable applications that all of you can use as you do at the click of a button. And this is something now which the world has recognized, admired, and is trying to replicate in other parts of the world. So with this, Tanuj, We'll come to the end of our presentation and I'll hand over to you if you want to ask me any questions or if any of the young people in the room want to ask questions, I have 15 minutes. Right, so uh, if, you, if you guys have questions, I hope you uh, send them to your TAs right now and then we'll take them online. Uh, I believe, uh, yeah, Mika is sending me the questions. That's great. In the meanwhile, Nandan, uh, first of all, uh, while we get those questions, I'm going to ask you here. Uh, what's it like working in the government, right? If you want to make change, I'm pretty sure when I was in Ashoka, I had dreams of, you know, causing large-scale change. Now, you worked in the private sector, you worked in the government sector. Tell us about your experience making change in either end and what would you, you know, how would yeah, you get sure. it? Well, you know, the private sector, by the way, the, by and large, the rules of the game are the same. So they're working in a steel company, a software company, or a garment company. Uh, you define success by revenue growth, profit growth, becoming more efficient, reducing cost, earning, increasing earnings per share, and so on and so forth. So a CFO can move from one industry to another without without forms because it's all with the same rules of accounting and same incentives and so on. Government is a far more complex environment because there's no definition of success and ideology divides people in different ways. So what one person thinks is successful, the other one may think it's a disaster. And therefore, how do you get in this very complex, chaotic world of public life? How do you actually get anything done is the challenge. And the way we did it was we simplified our message, simplified our technology, built something that could scale rapidly and uh, reach everybody, made sure its benefits were well articulated, kept the design minimal so that nobody felt that we were treading on their toes. I remember when we first started, you know, the passport guys would say, why do you need this? We have a passport. The income tax guys would say, why do you need this? You have a pan ID and so on. So we said, no, this is not solving those issues. You guys continue with your pan ID and passport and election voter ID card. All this does is says that Ashok is Ashok or Rafi is Rafi. And whether Rafi deserves a passport or not, you decide. After that, everybody heaved a sigh of relief and said, okay, you're not going to come into our turf. So it's very important to design your uh, idea that can be done without too much of resistance, doing it quickly, evangelizing and talking to everybody to get them on board, creating a win-win for everybody. 
It's a massive task of mobilization and evangelization. Thank you, Nandan. Uh, we have a question from Yashraj, which says, uh, it's a multi-part question, I'll go one by one. Is there any effort being made to take make UPI a worldwide platform? That's a great question. And uh, in fact, NPCI has set up a body under it called NPCI Global. Recently, they have announced that they're going to launch UPI in Nepal. They're also working with Singapore to connect Singapore's fast pay system to UPI so that people in these two countries can send money to each other instantaneously across borders. They're working with the UAE to launch uh, uh, UPI uh, acceptance QR codes in, in merchants in, in Dubai and so on. So if you go to Dubai to go shopping in a mall, pay using UPI. So lots of stuff is happening. They're talking to many, many countries to roll out UPI. So there is definitely big global interest in all these platforms. Similarly, on the ID side, Morocco, Philippines are using uh, ID infrastructure, open source so software similar to Aadhaar. The vaccination certificate built in India is being used in five other countries. So India's digital public goods is getting global acceptance. Uh, the next part of this question before we move to the other is, why are other countries not using UPI or a similar technology? So this is, I think, more interesting to answer. Well, I think the way it has evolved is uh, different, right? So in the West, they have a huge culture of credit cards and they have a huge investment in credit cards and the point of sale acceptance systems of credit cards. They have a good fee structure where businesses, banks and card companies can make money and something like UPI could be potentially disruptive there. In China, we, they have encouraged two private companies, Alipay and WeChat, and they dominate the market. And uh, therefore, it's been entirely led by two private companies who own 90% of the transactions. So the Indian model is where we combine regulation and competition and technology and came out with something where I could be having a phone pay app, I could be having a bank account in SBI, you could be having a Bheem app, you could be having an account in B Bank of Baroda, and you can still do transactions on a real-time basis. And that we have a common QR code across the country, so a merchant can put a QR code, and whether using phone pay or Paytm or Google Pay, you can pay at that merchant with that QR code. These are all interoperability principles that we have. So it's not easy to convince uh, countries where there's an existing incumbent structure uh, you know, there's no incentive for anyone to change because they lose money. Incidentally, Google wrote to the Fed, which is the U.S. Federal Reserve, sometime back saying that the Fed is planning a real-time payment system called Fed Now, and uh, supposed to come out only in 2024. And Google has recommended that it should be modeled along UPI. So even in America, they're saying maybe they should use UPI as a model. Okay. Uh, no, no, I will... Uh, uh start with one uh, or two questions which are kind of similar uh, because they're related to your government service. One is how do we fix, uh, you know, somebody saying that in the identity, the data itself may not be correct because there are no birth certificates or no permanent addresses, right? So I think this is your, uh, um, your Aadhaar and how your design of Aadhaar kind of question, which I want to combine with uh, how difficult was convincing the initial million users that this is reliable and easy number one. And uh, number two, uh, this question about how do we ensure that the data is, that is being collected is not misused. So multiple have asked this question. I think these are from yeah. Arundhati, Vrinda and Kritin. Yes. No, no. I think these are all great questions. First of all, uh, you know, what was happening in India in the last 20 years is there was more and more migration happening. You know, in the old India before maybe 20, 30 years back, people largely lived in their villages or small towns. We didn't need an ID. But in the last 20 years, there's been massive migration from north to south, from east to west, you know, people from Bihar going to work in Punjab and all that stuff. And fundamentally, the lack of a birth certificate or lack of ID was a big challenge. And we had to find a way to give IDs to people who never had IDs. And we made sure that everybody got only one ID. We didn't want too many IDs because this was, you know, if the ID itself was unreliable, then we would have a bigger problem which is why we use biometric deduplication to make sure that everybody got only one ID. So if you try to enroll a second time with a different name and the biometric was the same, then we were rejecting it. Now, this is obviously a massive technological challenge, which took us some 
time to figure out, but we got it done. And therefore, the demand was very large. In fact, when I got approval from the cabinet to do a pilot in uh, August of 2009, the pilot was not 1 million, the pilot was 100 million. So in India, only, only in India, you can call the 100 million <laughs> thing as the pilot, but anyway, we call it as a pilot. So, and we, you know, wherever, and we began not in the city so much as in rural India where people didn't have IDs and the response was fantastic because everybody, though they didn't know what was coming, said, look, this is going to help my life. They're, they're giving me something which allows me to be recognized. So we had overwhelming demand. And I can show you pictures from the old days where there were lines of people standing up to get their Aadhaar. So we never had a marketing problem in that sense. Now, in terms of data, the data, data is kept very securely. It's encrypted. It's kept offline. It's not on the internet. Only the minutiae, which is like an extract of that is for, for authentication. Uh, there's lots and lots of things. I can't get it all, but a lot of focus on making it highly secure because we're all very aware of the fact that if you're going to have biometric data of a billion Indians, you better keep it safe. Right. No, no, some questions on UPI. Uh, three questions again, I'm clubbing. Was there any bureaucratic challenges you faced when you tried to create a unified platform? Number one, in a similar vein, uh, what is the backlash coming from the private sector when uh, UPI was launched? Zero transaction fees, troublesome for the financial sector. Uh, you know, does the government stream roll its way into these things? Those are all UPI. And there is a comment here that previously there's been uh, Vijay Shekhar Sharma on the classroom. And he has said that UPI transactions may be taxed and wallets are the way to go. So I'm only paraphrasing what I'm hearing from here. I'm not sure what DS has said, but all UPI questions to you. Yeah. Well, I think first of all, uh, obviously navigating UPI was a very complex task. We had to convince the banks. We had to convince the Reserve Bank of India. We had to get consumer companies to adopt UPI. So we had to get the phone pays and the Googles of the world to adopt UPI. Uh, and uh, for many people, incumbents did feel it was a threat because it made everything interoperable. It was not a wallet kind of closed wall garden approach. So yes, there was resistance, but you know, even in Aadhaar, there was resistance. So fundamentally, when you're doing the you know transformation at this scale, there are bound to be some people who feel that their business is going to get affected. So, so uh, we had to deal with all that. And the original UPI was not based on zero transaction cost. Uh, it's subsequent day that the government wanted to popularize UPI and made it zero transaction cost. And there are a number of views on this. I mean, obviously, you can't make money on payment. That's also why they became so popular. Because, you know, now a vegetable vendor in Bangalore when I go down the road is using UPI to, get, uh, to buy vegetables. Because when I pay, you know, 20 rupees for vegetables, she gets 20 rupees. And the fact that that's like money, you know, it's like cash, physical cash. There's no, there's this free, right? I mean, the, there's no transaction cost. So the UPI became wildly popular for that. And way companies are making money is building uh, capabilities on top of UPI. For example, you have the ASBA thing for stock, stock IPOs. You have UPI auto pay for subscriptions. Like you want to say, I want to get Netflix and I want to pay 10 rupees a month for 110 months. You can set that up as an auto pay instruction. So people are making money on the fee income in that. And I don't see why they should tax UPI because I mean, the government is trying to popularize digital payments. And that's why they've gone to 5 billion. They want to go billion a day. So it's not clear to me why they would tax UPI. Okay. And then uh, since it's very close to leaving, I am just going to take two questions. One is on your Infosys. Uh, the question is, how did Infosys manage the great resignation wave for the pandemic? Because... Uh, so the company like yours, uh, you know, this really impacts. So how did I manage? Second question, nobody's asked this. I said, do you have a message for all these students who are studying at the Center of Entrepreneurship that you can give them? And then I'll take whatever remains all these questions here and probably see what I can do. Sure. Uh, thanks, Tanod. Well, I think, yes, of course, Infosys also has had high attrition. Uh, it was very low in the beginning of the pandemic, but it's, it's, it's certainly not just Infosys, every company, it's gone up dramatically in the last one year. And that's because the global digital acceleration has created a huge demand for technology talent, especially with the right digital skills. Yes, so it is, it is a thing. Uh, do we have a complete answer? I'm not sure yet. 
but we are all working on how to make it more attractive you know whatever it is that people need better compensation a better more flexible work to home from home all that stuff so definitely but i don't think any company in the world has really dealt with what is happening and what was the second question tanush then all students at the center for entrepreneurship at ashoka university no, no, i mean you know, i think all of you are extremely lucky because india is in a golden age of entrepreneurship we are seeing uh, a completely vibrant uh, talent and startup ecosystem last year alone we had 44 unicorns uh, this year there'll be at least 50 unicorns in spite of the fact that markets are under pressure because of interest rate hikes uh, i see uh, terrific founders these days who have great ambition and commitment to building institutional com companies of large size i think you guys are the right place in the right country at the right time so go for it and all the very best all right okay nandan i want to be mindful of your time uh, we are at the close of this section and take some of the other questions wish so does you uh, do you want to close the remarks please yeah yeah nandan thank you so much uh, you know I, i just want to say to the students that if you ever think about impact and positive impact on a large scale it's hard to beat what nandan has done um so i think that's super inspiring today by the way i met a cab driver after a long time who didn't take a upi payment so really we'll track him down we'll we'll send him <laughs> for an interrogation but otherwise <laughs> it it's a very rare thing so thank you so much nandan thank you guys so all much. the best okay. friends take okay. care bye bye